I'm Liz Fitzgerald. I'm Jamie Bowers. And my name is Susanna Arminska. And we are librarians here at the Culinary Literacy Center. Um, we are so excited. No. Aha, thank you. Um, we're so excited to have you here, uh, not only at the Parkway Central Library, which is our main branch of the Free Library of Philadelphia, but we're really excited and proud to have you here in our city, in Philadelphia. Um, I, I really loved uh, the, well, the keynote this morning, and I think that it um, is a good transition to some of the things that we're going to talk about, um, especially about Philadelphia. Um, we have some amazing things here in Philadelphia, like the Free Library. Um, and Philadelphia is a city of brotherly love and sisterly affection. And in this city, the Free Library really is the heart of Philadelphia. We have 54 branches around the city, which means that we are in every neighborhood here. And we are advancing literacy, guiding learning, and inspiring curiosity every day. Um, Philadelphia, yesterday we had someone from the Fairmount Park Conservancy here. Fairmount Park is the largest urban green space in the country. Um, we also in Philadelphia have a really bustling uh, food and beverage scene. I hope that you all had a chance. Um, I know that there were some people at the bar the other night, so we heard. Um, <laughs> we also, um, we are a city of firsts. We had the first computer, the first hospital, uh, the first library. We are the birthplace of um, Kevin Bacon. <laughs> We are at the birthplace of Kevin Hart, the other Kevin. Um, also some royalty. Uh, Princess Grace was born here, and so was the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. <laughs> um, but Philadelphia is not a city without its challenges. We have half a million adults in Philadelphia who are low literate, which means that they have a hard time filling out a job application. Um, they are, would find it challenging to apply and participate in remedial community college classes. Um, we have a poverty rate of 26%. That makes Philadelphia the poorest big city in America. Uh, one in four Philadelphians is food insecure, meaning that they lack access to fresh and healthy foods in their neighborhood. Um, there's one third of Philadelphia's adults are obese and one in five children are obese here in Philadelphia. So these were some of the driving factors behind Siobhan's brilliant idea to open a culinary literacy center here at the Free Library. <clears throat> um, the Culinary Literacy Center, which is just down the hall, and if you didn't get a chance to come yesterday, please, um, we'd love to have you stop in at some point today. The Culinary Literacy Center is the first space of its kind in the library in the country. Um, we have a, a huge prep table up in the front where our chef educators can come in and demonstrate what they're doing, cameras that zoom in and then go to the giant TV in the corner so that everyone can see what's going on. We have um, kitchen tools and gadgets that uh, every home cook would want to have in their kitchen. Uh, and the whole premise of our program is built on the fact that cooking and eating are educational acts. Um, and our mission at the Culinary Literacy Center is to advance literacy through food and cooking around a communal table. Um, and we're going to tell you today a little bit of how we do that. But first, Jamie is going to tell us a little bit more about culinary literacy, because we keep saying that term. So culinary literacy, we've heard about it, we're talking about it, but what does it actually mean? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw that back out to all of you. You can shout it out. What do you think that term means? What comes to your mind when you hear culinary literacy? How to read recipes. How to read recipes. I was thinking how to read a nutritional label. How, how to read a nutritional label. I'm going to repeat your questions in case anyone, or your answers in case anyone can't hear. Anyone else? No wrong answers here, just, just brainstorming. <gasps> cultural heritage, the cultural heritage that we bring with us. One more? Vocabulary building. Well, as the first kitchen classroom in a public library in the United States, we have had the great honor to define what culinary literacy means <laughs> for a public library. So we're defining it two ways. Um, one way is learning about cooking, and then the other is learning through cooking. 
So learning about cooking is a really um, straightforward definition. Things that we already talked about. Everything you need to learn to be able to cook from scratch. So how to read a recipe, how to hold a knife, um, all about ingredients. But what also is really important to us is uh, going beyond the individual and thinking about a community-based understanding of learning about cooking. So we want to know, we want to ask questions like, where does our food come from? Who are the people who are preparing our food and serving our food? How are they treated? What happens to the animals we eat? What are the environmental impacts of our food choices? So the second definition, learning through cooking, that's when we take cooking and we, we shift it from the object of learning to the vehicle for learning. So we're not actually learning how to cook in the, sef in the second definition. We're using cooking to learn an entirely different subject. So you can learn math through measuring and ratio cooking. You can learn reading and writing through recipes and nutrition labels. You can learn about science through pickling and uh, making, making ice cream with um, liquid nitrogen. Um, we can learn about culture and history through food. We can learn, we learn about each other through food, really. At the Culinary Literacy Center, we are, we're advancing multiple literacies. As Liz said, cooking and eating are educational acts. So, ah, <laughs> does it not go back? Here we go. No. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so, um, we like to think of our program programming in two different buckets. Um, one are programs for the public, and the other are our special programs. So, we're going to tell you today, uh, Susanna, Liz, and I, about four of our special programs. And the one you see right up here, this is a picture of our Cooking with Confidence class. Cooking with Confidence class, is, Cooking with Confidence is a cooking class for adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, students and support staff learn together in an inclusive kitchen classroom, and they uh, eat a meal that they've all prepared together from scratch. The number one goal of this class really is to have fun while cooking and trying new things. Um, but while students are having fun, they're learning skills that they can use um, to help them live more independently, like um, how to read a recipe or how to follow a recipe, um, how to stay safe in the kitchen, and all about healthy ingredients. Um, we are so excited that our Cooking with Confidence class was selected for Drexel University's Excite Center Seed Funding. So we were among six projects selected. We're going to expand this program um, along with the Philadelphia Autism Project to create a class designed specifically for people with autism spectrum disorder. We are um, really excited about the, the chance to expand and uh, help more people feel comfortable and confident in the kitchen and help um, activate all of the benefits that come along with learning to cook from scratch, all the literary, literacy and health benefits. Nourishing Literacy, which is now in its fourth year, serves students pre-K through eighth grade, and we really work with these classes to support classroom learning. Um, and we're doing that through hands-on cooking classes. And I will say that our experience, the three of us have backgrounds as children's librarians, so in those four years, when we've been involved in this uh, particular class, which involves a curriculum that we've created, um, we're really drawing from those experiences as children's librarians. And I will say that there's something truly magical about being able to bring into our, our kitchen classroom 36th graders who transform this space into a fast casual restaurant where they create plant-based burritos and learn about food systems in a really interactive and provocative way. Cookability, which is now in its second year, serves people with visual impairments. And this class is led by a chef who is himself legally blind. And we all work together in this classroom setting to engage three different organizations who bring groups together to really empower these individuals to learn and share 
adaptive and accessible techniques to making healthful meals in their home kitchens. And you know, we really draw from library resources. So many of those participants uh, work with uh, resources like the National Library Service for the Blind, which Dr. Carla Hayden is a proud keeper of, um, to access cookbooks that really serve their particular needs. Um, and we also look at really having a fun time in this kitchen, so we're not afraid to make mistakes, we're not afraid to get messy. And then we also really look at specific techniques that are useful for the kitchen setting, like mise en place, where we're able to set ingredients into a clockwise um, arrangement so that a person is able to say, okay, peppers are at three o'clock, tomatoes are at uh, six o'clock, and be able to draw from those ingredients, and also to be able to measure ingredients um, and create beautiful pieces like the ones that you see before you today. Edible Alphabet is our program for English language learners. Our students who join us for Edible Alphabet, they can be um, immigrants here in Philadelphia who have been here for a decade or more who want the chance to practice um, and improve their English, or we also have students who are refugees who have been in the country for mere days by the time they come into our program. And what the students are doing is it's a six week course where every week is built around a recipe. So the students are learning the vocabulary of the cooking tools and techniques like chop, saute, mince. They're also learning the vocabulary of the ingredients that we're using, um, carrot, onion, vegetable stock. Those are hints for later. Um, and it's, it, you know, we've had such success with this program here at the Central Library that we've been able to expand the program and we've brought Edible Alphabet out to the neighborhood libraries. Um, we've brought it to neighborhood libraries where there are high concentrations of non-native English speakers. And we also have developed a curriculum around the program. So we have our very own free library ESL curriculum. Um, and we have the six week course and then we also uh, created an additional 10 week part to it that is a more traditional ESL curriculum that's built around the context of libraries. So um, people are learning how to read a receipt, and it's a library receipt. Um, they're learning how to fill out a library card application. Um, so, And there are a lot of these skills that they're learning are easily transferable to a lot of other things that they're encountering. So um, we heard about our special programs, and here's a little bit more about our public programs. Our public programs are open to everyone. We've got classes on anything you could ever want to learn about cooking. Um, in our class, in our kitchen, you can learn how to hold a knife, how to bake a cake. You can learn about African vegan, ancient Roman, contemporary Laotian cooking. Um, you can come see your favorite cookbook author. You can watch a butcher demonstrate how to take a goat apart, a whole goat. It's not alive when it comes in. No, <laughs> not the slaughter, just the butchering. But it's, it's interesting, uh, the butchers wear um, chain mail, like a chain mail apron, it's wild. Um, we've got classes that keep your health and your wallet in mind. So heart healthy plant-based cooking, as well as how to make soup with the scraps in your fridge, the odds and ends in your fridge. Now, I was at our German strudel class, which was really amazing. Um, and we had to take this little piece of dough, may maybe about this big, and it was in the center of a table like this, and we had to all roll it out and spread it so that it went to every single corner of the table. And so around the table, we had to sort of lift it up so that it wasn't stuck, and here we were, Strangers, people that wouldn't come together anywhere else, people that didn't know each other, elbow to elbow in this like intimate experience when we had to delicately lift <laughs> this uh, dough up, it, it billowed and it looked like a silk curtain. It was really just gorgeous. We rolled it up together, we cooked it, we ate together and you know, we said, so what neighborhood are you from? <laughs> where, where are <laughs> Where are you from? How'd you get here? Have you ever been here before? And uh, the keynote just mentioned that the library is the last public space. And I, and I ask you, where else would people come do this? 
elsewhere else but the public library. So we've talked a little bit about the ways in which we serve our communities and this is only one of 54 locations in our library system. We know that Philadelphia is really a city of neighborhoods and that there is a library in every neighborhood which we're really fortunate to have. Um, and so in looking at really being equitable and really serving <coughs> specific needs in specific communities, we've been able to bring culinary literacy programming out into those libraries, building off of the needs, the strengths, and the interests of those communities. And I might add, engaging with the community organizers who have been brought to the table as part of the 21st Century Library Initiative. Uh, but how are we doing this? Down the hall, we have a million dollar kitchen. How are we bringing these programs out into neighborhood libraries that have community rooms, meeting rooms, like many of you have in your branch libraries? We're doing that in one of two ways. And it goes from simple to sophisticated. So our first approach could range from $100 to a $700 investment, where we have these kitchen in a box kits that we build out from a simple closet space downstairs, and we send it out to the neighborhood libraries, depending on which recipes are being created. Is this a one-off program or a series? Uh, but everything that you would need, all of the kitchen equipment that you might need to prepare those recipes is included in the kit. Kit comes back, and we start it all over again. Another approach that we've been able to take is at two locations, we've been able to um, bring out these kitchen carts. So this is a, you know, a great, great grandson of the chuck wagon. And this cart allows community educators, this is a registered dietitian from the local grocery store, uh, librarians that we've trained, community edu educators that we've trained to be able to use this setup and offer classes in a space much like this. Um, and I will say that we continue to streamline this approach and it's something that we would welcome you all to try in your library locations. And we've even got a toolkit that we can share with you <laughs> to talk more about that. Um, and, and we do, you know, Susanna said you can do it in a space like this, um, which we will, but you can also do it in a very tiny meeting room space, which we have done um, in a meeting room space in the basement of one of our branch libraries. We've been able to do our uh, edible alphabet program. So it can be done anywhere that you have access to a table and running water and electricity. And uh, at Next Library, this is not planned, but at Next Library, <laughs> when we flew to to Denmark, we weren't gonna bring all the knives with us. So um, we just arrived ourselves and before our presentation went to Ikea and the real, the original Ikea. And we built a kitchen in a box and it was just like home. The, the, friendly, the friendly cab driver that we had was very confused about why we were from Philadelphia going to his local Ikea. <laughs> um, so uh, before we move into the next part of our program, um, I just wanted to share with you, we started out with some fairly uh, sad statistics about Philadelphia, um, but I wanted to share with you some of what we have been doing here with the Culinary Literacy Center. Uh, we have created a community. We've shared our programs um, with nearly 21,000 people since we opened in June of 2014. The, they have come to over 800 programs that we've hosted here and in our neighborhood libraries. We've given away, as part of our programs, nearly 1,000 bags of groceries, 500 cookbooks, and uh, 120 uh, kitchen tools, everything from blenders to stock pots, um, immersion blenders. And we've also been fortunate to have the opportunity to come to things like this and share our story. And hopefully, uh, people will be inspired to uh, start culinary literacy programming at their libraries. Our, our next adventure, um, and I would be remiss if I missed this opportunity to ask a room full of library directors, um, but the next thing that we're getting into is adult basic education. And so I would love if anyone here is doing something wonderful um, around adult basic education, please come find me after the presentation so we can chat. Um, all right, so now we've told you a little bit about our program but um, we would like to invite you to experience our program to see how you can do it anywhere. 
So I would like to invite you all to be a part of our Edible Alphabet program now. Welcome um, to class. <coughs> welcome to class, everyone. Now, our Edible Alphabet classes usually are two and a half hours to three hours. And um, don't worry, Rebecca, we are not going to take all of that time. <laughs> but what we're going to do now is um, do one of the exercises and activities that we do in class. And then we're going to call on some volunteers to come up and help us cook the uh, uh, mid-morning snack for everyone. <laughs> uh, no, don't worry, you really don't have to cook for everyone, but we are going to um, demonstrate how we do the cooking part. Um, and then we'll have the snack. <laughs> so, now, um, this is one of our exercises in class. It's the, the soup that we're doing uh, today, students, is a carrot coriander soup. Um, and so uh, it, with this exercise, we have the whole curriculum book and there are exercises in here, but this has been an additional add-on. We have two instructors, an edible alphabet, an ESL instructor, and a chef instructor. And we encourage them, uh, I don't know if you've seen ESL instructors in action, but it's amazing. Uh, they're like constantly thinking on their feet and um, coming up with new ideas and, and um, activities to support the learning. And so uh, what we're asking you today to do is to discuss your favorite type of soup. You're going to get out a pen and a paper, find a partner, introduce yourselves, and then tell your partner the ingredients of your favorite soup. Your partner will then write down the ingredients. Now, the reason why our students love this activity is because it's not something from the curriculum book. It's asking them to draw on their own funds of knowledge. So things that they know about already, things they're excited to share. And our students are not only excited to share with one another, but also they um, are, get really excited to share with Chef uh, and ask for tips, and um, they're often wowing him with their ideas. So students, <laughs> grab a pen or a pencil, find a partner, introduce yourself, make sure you introduce yourself, and tell the ingredients of your favorite soup to your partner. Sorry. Okay, so we've got 14 minutes, so <laughs> let's keep the show moving. Um, would someone like to share their uh, favorite ingredients? Just one person, come on. Oh, can you introduce? Yeah, introduce your uh, partner. Hold on. Well, I'm introducing Sharon, and she's from Pennsylvania, correct? And you are Lauren, also from Pennsylvania, and I'm Mary from Maryland. Um, and their favorite soup, we did it together, is chicken noodle soup. And their favorite ingredient is rotisserie chicken that you used to make mm. basic stock, which I thought was really clever. Okay. Carrot, celery, a bay leaf, and then thick cut noodles that her mom gets from the freezer somewhere. <laughs> When can we come over? <laughs> oh, go ahead. Uh, Mary had a really delicious sounding crab soup mm. with backfin crab, a really good stock, like a chicken stock, butter, cream, and definitely Old Bay seasoning. Wow, wow. I wish we could do this all afternoon. <laughs> but um, thank Hank, you. So I, I don't know if you guys noticed, but it, was, it got loud in here, right? <laughs> Um, and that's really the magic that happens when you're talking about food uh, and when you're cooking together. So uh, we talked about food. Now we'd like to cook together. We need four volunteers. Four volunteers. Please. Four volunteers. Oh, oh, got one back there. Come on up. Three more. Please don't be shy. All right. Yes. Okay. All right. Come on up. All right. We've got our four volunteers. We've got our four. Thank, Thank you. you. Let's give them a big hand. Now, Brave these souls. four volunteers are going to be cooking for all of us, remember. Um, oh, I think we may have one extra. All right. No, I, we have four. Do we have four? Yeah, okay, we yeah. Have four. I'm counting Susanna. <laughs> um, all right. So we please um, wash your hands because we have sanitizer. We don't want the soup to be. Actually, one of the really important things that we stress in our classes. Um, particularly when we have the preschoolers in, because, you know, they're always like, nah, and then on the food. Uh, um, so hand washing mm -hmm. is very important. Um, and so our volunteers right are going to come up uh -huh. here. How we do this in class um, is 
we do sort of a, we break up our students into groups. So, um, and we do this really intentionally because the students um, tend to self select the groups that they're in. Oh, please, by all means, can you guys? Uh, oh, sure. All right. So um, the students tend to self select based on um, the language that they're speaking, and so we break them up to um, encourage them to speak in English. And so could one of our volunteers please, um, I'm going to read the ingredients actually to keep this moving just to make sure that there are no allergies in the room. Um, and that's another thing when you're doing culinary literacy programming, um, it probably goes without saying, but um, stay away from nuts. Um, two pounds of carrots peeled, one white onion, two stalks of celery, two tablespoons of ground coriander, one one inch piece of ginger minced, two quarts of vegetable stock, a quarter cup of parsley, it usually is cilantro, but we wanted to make sure to account for anyone who has the cilantro thing, um, <laughs> olive oil, salt, and pepper. All right, so knife skills, knife skills, hand washing and knife skills sort of go hand in hand with our two um, uh, most important lessons. So can everyone please, you're all gonna learn a little bit of uh, culinary literacy today. So um, with the proper t technique for using a chef's knife, and we give chef's knives to um, everyone 10 and up, um, yes, don't be afraid. The real key is giving uh, the right tool for the job and telling people how to use them. So your non-dominant hand is like a claw. Can I see everyone's claw, please? So the non-dominant hand is a claw. And then with your dominant hand, you hold the knife by the handle. You don't hold it like Susanna is showing with your finger on top. No. <laughs> you grab. Yes, that's actually, Michelle, you've got it. Um, you hold it by the, um, on the tip of the blade, and then the rest of your fingers grasp around the handle. And you rock. And when you, the claw is really important so that you don't chop your fingers off. Please. Oh my goodness, look at that. Oh Skyline room, this is amazing technology. Um, all right, so while our students are, oh I have a slide, but that's okay. Um, while our students are working on this, Evelyn, do you mind? Thank you. While our students are busy making soup for 160 people, I'd like to tell you just a little bit more about Edible Alphabet. So Edible Alphabet, um, we have seen over 250 students since we started this program in 2015. Our students are coming from uh, everywhere, from uh, Iraq, Syria, um, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Ukraine. Um, our students are coming from all over the world and they're speaking a myriad of different languages. And all of our students get a library card as a part of Edible Alphabet. It's built into the lesson. The culinary skills. Our students, um, part of what makes Edible Alphabet so special is that um, our students really excel in cooking. Um, many of the people who come to the Culinary Literacy Center come because they want to learn culinary skills, but um, our students really have uh, our powerhouses in the kitchen. And this allows them to excel in a space where they don't traditionally in an English class. Um, but we are also finding that our students are taking the recipes that they learn in class and bringing them home and recreating the meals for their families. And we give our students, um, anyone who participates in five out of the six weeks as an incentive, we give them a kitchen tool, like an immersion blender or a stock pot. Um, and so that's just another opportunity to continue the learning. Communication. Our students are encouraged, like I said, to speak in English. And um, one of the things that's really great, it's a negotiation of meaning. I'm learning a lot of terms that are in the TESOL world. So negotiation of meaning when they're speaking, when two um, non-native English speakers are speaking in English to one another, they're sort of teasing out the communication um, in English to figure out what one another um, really is meaning. So um, that's a, a really great benefit of the program. I'm gonna do my best Bob Barker now. Slide over here, how is it going with the chopping? Oh, oh, just trying to get this ginger under control. All right, we're getting some ginger under control. How about these carrots, they look beautiful. Coming right along, yes. All right, now, um, who, can you tell me your name, please? My name's Carrie. Carrie, and Carrie, who's standing next to you? Michelle. 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 See, and this is what happened. In our classes, friendships are made. <laughs> Harry and Michelle. 
BFFs. So, thank you. Um, and I just want to tell a little anecdote. You can imagine um, this has been three minutes of standing next to one another, uh, chopping. But when our students spend six weeks together, friendships are formed. We have uh, two women who have participated. You're only meant to come to one six-week course, but they have come to four <laughs> of the programs now. Um, Tila. Tila is uh, a Nepali woman. She's a Nepali grandmother. Her uh, b friend in class is Samira, who is an Iraqi uh, grandmother. And they are both bosses in the kitchen. <laughs> they frequently are um, positioning themselves as the expert. Um, they'll correct one another, like, no Tila, not like that. No Samira, like this. Um, but really, connections are made and friendships are built and uh, what we found, we just had an evaluation done on this program, and um, stereotypes are being dismantled in class, not only from the uh, English speakers in the class, the program manager, the ESL instructor, the, um, but also among the students. That's been a, a really great byproduct of this. Um, literacy, our students are learning English, which is great, because we're doing what we're saying we're doing. Um, and we found that they're learning the vocabulary. Um, and another thing, another really great benefit of this program has been that Edible Alphabet provides a space. <laughs> well, and this is what our students have to learn how to operate in a standard measurement system. And many of them are used to metric, but that looks beautiful. Um, our students in Edible Alphabet find a place where they can interact with kind, patient, and uh, Americans, and that place is the library. And actually, I wanted to share this one quote from Carolina, which Carolina had to say was that immigrants need a place where help is there, and people say, you are welcome to this country, you are welcome to know about us, you are welcome. Edible Alphabet is some place when you can see, no, this city is not like I thought, it is better. Um, maybe cry a here. I definitely cried when I read it. Um, but it really just shows how important this program is. And we have been doing this program for so long. Um, one of our six-week courses actually spanned, uh, it was October and November last year. Um, and we were a class full of refugees from um, the Middle East, from Southeast Asia, uh, and a lot of the countries where... Um, I mean, uh, it goes without saying, but it was over the election um, that this class banned, and we had a class actually the day after the election, and it was a really powerful way where we could um, just remind people that the library is a space for inclusion, where we celebrate diversity. Um, and so how's the soup going? <laughs> it does smell great, doesn't it? So now we, it looks like we have some sautéed vegetables that we're going to add some stock to. Does that not smell delicious? <laughs> All right, and now because Ugh. the recipe says that you have to simmer it for 20 minutes, don't worry, we're not going to do that. Um, but we are going to do the TV show trick, <laughs> where here we have. Uh, All right, <laughs> simmered, uh, and it's ready for the immersion blender. So you are going to please puree. I'm a little bit nervous. I have to. Okay, you don't want to do it in that cup? Try not to do the <laughs> um, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Yeah. The floors are easily cleaned, right? Yeah. We were going to do it in the cup. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, um, I, I believe we have some soup coming. Got some soup ready. <laughs> the soup will be here. Thanks for making all the soup, everyone, and for I 165 people. You know what? We have... A, an amazing kitchen manager, <laughs> Dom Akers. He uh, came to us as a high school student in his senior year from Swenson Tech. It's a technical school where he was a culinary major here in Philadelphia. He graduated. He's going on to the Culinary Institute in January he has, with he a full ride. Um, so we gave, Dom <laughs> we gave Dom a regular recipe for carrot uh, coriander soup, and we said, well, we need uh, 165 servings, 165 two-ounce servings, and 
And this program says a snack, so you also need to add something with this to it on the side. So <laughs> Dom was like, wow, this is a massive math problem. And we were like, culinary literacy, Dom. <laughs> culinary literacy. Um, and, and so Dom, we also have another work-study student here, Caitlin. She just started. Caitlin just started. She is from the Community College of Philadelphia, where she is also in the culinary program. So while we're waiting, does anyone have any questions for us? Yes. We, so Can was the program, um, we had an evaluation on the program, was that the student's evaluation or was it formal? Uh, we did a formal evaluation. We had a consultant who came in and um, spent six weeks just quietly in the class taking notes. It's a 40 page document. It is gold. Uh, um, but it's amazing and we feel really fortunate to have gotten that because, um, and it wasn't cheap, I mean you know that evaluating your programs are not inexpensive um, and but it, it's really been invaluable and so what we're doing now is we're at this juncture um, I think with our whole program in general it's been th almost three and a half years at that point where you need to stop and just examine and see are you really doing the things you say you're doing um, and how do you achieve the goals that you have so any, any other questions yes great question um, there are a couple different revenue streams. We have a, a caterer here who they do, um, we do private events and a portion of the rental income for the events that happen here go uh, to the city, they take their share, we get some back and that supports the program. We also have private uh, sponsorships. We, uh, Deason Watson, thank you, um, sponsored our Charlie carts, those mobile kitchen carts. Um, we have grants from foundations. Um, and then we also have our ticket revenue from our programs. Our evening programs range from free to about $30. Um, and we, in the beginning, we were doing all of our programming for free, but I mean, you all know, if you have a program for free, um, not everybody shows up. And that really became challenging when we were talking about buying food for people um, and ingredients. Sure. All right, one. Oh, yeah, any other questions before, yes. FDA certification? What is this? We are, do we I are want to serve safe We are certified. all serve safe certified. We've been certified by the um, Philadelphia Department of Health. We get inspections uh, twice a year. But we, is this something for making value added product in the space? I for was told that the money for it. Oh. Oh, like huh. uh, oh, like SNAP education? USDA? Yeah, so um, we do not have funding through the USDA right now. Um, to be quite honest, it scares me a little um, with all of the red tape around it. Um, but I, it, it is something that's continually come up about looking into it. So I'd love to talk to you about your program a little bit more. Yes. We serve food and we get everybody cooking with it. Um, it just looks different because they're in a different space. Well, I mean, I, I would ask you maybe not to reach out to them. <laughs> but, but truly, I mean, libraries have been doing food programming forever, right? I mean, everybody does the, like, candy, sushi, and cook. Great, good plan. So we know Should everyone. Okay? So we know everyone wants to get a little bit of soup and snack before it gets cold. So we are available for questions. And Susanna wanted to. We want to thank you, uh, all four of our volunteers. Please, <laughs> please do not remove your aprons because we want you to match Dr. Hayden and keep your aprons as a token of our appreciation. 
thank you so much. And also, we'd like to say a big thank you to Jameson, our edible alphabet chef, and um, Urim and the Brulee team for helping us make the movie magic soup. Don and Caitlin.